Let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> now we're on the last leg of the book of Revelation here. And uh, we've decided to go on as long as the Lord allows us to go on. Okay. Uh, that could be uh, a few more classes or that could be all the way to close to Christmas. Now that may seem long, but we do have a conference and there are some Thursdays that we will need to use for work days and et cetera, et cetera, bah. <laughs> but, but that is the case. So we're just going to do this. However, this last section is, a, is going to <clears throat> really cover the rest of the book in the, in the sense of instead of trying to explain the book of Revelation um, in all of its symbolism and all of the things that the normal approach that people do um, and, uh, and the storyline even per se, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and we've been doing this somewhat, but we're going to go through and we're going to contrast the Lamb of God with the beasts that are mentioned throughout. Now, I uh, some time ago, Years and years ago, I did a little bit of this sort of sharing. Uh, I think it was I, I think it was on the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation together. We did Daniel slash Revelation, <clears throat> and I had a section similar to this, but it's not the same material. Um, <clears throat> and I think this time around, it, there's going to be uh, a little more um, <clears throat> emphasis on certain things. Uh, for example, Christ crucified. Um, but I don't know the name of that course, but it was probably in the Bible school. It was probably called Daniel and Revelation. And if you end up enjoying from this point on and want more, uh, that may be online. I don't know. I don't know what's online. I never go online. <laughs> I don't read my own stuff. It's just a thing. It's a, thing, it's a thing with me. I've, I've heard him preach, and it's not that good. So, <laughs> all right. You know, I'm not that impressed. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So, uh, let's look at uh, Revelation 11 and verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, notice that word, the beast that ascendeth, out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. This is talking about uh, um, this contrast of the beast with those who follow the lamb. Notice the word beast. Notice that there looks like there's an ascension here. He ascends. Notice that the result of his ascension is that he's free now to make war against what follows the Lamb. Okay, it's important because, uh, and, and what I'm going to try to do also, since I know I have a lot of material left, is I'm going to try to do a little more reading, but in that process, um, we're going to have to look at a lot of scriptures. And we're going to do that because many of you here have been through a lot of different courses that I've taught and you sort of know some of the, if, if nothing else, you know a lot of these scriptures just by your own personal searching and hunger and desire for Jesus. But we do have some people on Skype and we do have new students and students that may watch this later that don't have all of that behind them as you do. And not only that, it doesn't hurt us to read the Bible. <laughs> so we're going to do some Bible reading along the way, okay, <clears throat> as we just did. All right, so let me read some of these notes. In the book of Revelation, when presenting an alternative to the wisdom and power and weakness that is Christ crucified, John paints those who function by the wisdom of this age as ferocious creatures with powerful yet brutal intentions. And that's what we saw in this scripture, and you see it over and over and over again in the book of Revelation. You see 
various beasts attacking what belongs to the lamb. <clears throat> um, this was not an uncommon designation by New Testament writers. So I want to just show you that, um, that this concept of beast now, and some of you remember several years ago in our Thanksgiving conference in November, uh, I, my sharing was on Noah. Some of you remember that. And not only, not only that, was that about two years ago? Um, but not only that, but that's, that sharing came in the middle of the year, right about this same time. As a matter of fact, I was teaching in Noah about two years ago, and we got, there was a part in the sharing that I wanted to preach at the conference, but I just kept teaching what God gave me right up to that date, and it landed on exactly what I wanted to share in that conference. And um, uh, that's the faithfulness of God, and that's, that proves that probably his idea of when to share what is better than mine, and I trust him. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to show you, uh, and, and in that, excuse me, before I pass along that, in Noah, he was in the ark with these beasts, all these beasts, and we, we made a, a certain particular emphasis on that fact. I want to show you that, that in, the, in some New Testament scriptures that that concept of beasts does relate to us or mankind or fallen nature or the enemy or whatever and that it is not just found in revelation but revelation is expounding what the other new testament writers have said but he's just using imagery to explain that so let's let's look at several scriptures on that you might want to keep your place in revelation but let's go to second peter <coughs> first We'll go to 2 Peter first, then we'll go to 1 Peter second. Not really. We will go to 2 Peter first, though. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> verse 12 says, But these, this is 2 Peter 2 12, but these as natural brute beasts. made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. All right. Well, you can read the full context of that later, but basically it's talking about those who attack and pervert and um, corrupt. It's the beast in the book of Revelation. And when I say beast, I'm, I'm adding an S there. You probably can't hear it. Beasts. We'll, we'll, we'll show that also here in a moment. But when usually we say beast and book of Revelation, we think of one beast. But there are many beasts in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> All right. Now let's go to, uh, just flip over a few books to Jude, book of Jude. That's just before the book of Revelation. Jude chapter 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. And it goes on, woe unto them, they've gone the way of Cain, and da 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 da, and on and on. And you begin to see that <clears throat> um, the New Testament writers are dealing with um, people but they, they bear characteristics of beasts. And that's significant to the book of Revelation. It helps us to understand uh, the spirit of what's behind things. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, Titus uh, chapter 1. And I wanted to go to Titus because um, uh, I think it's been a while since some of you have been in the book of Titus. I think it's time you come back. <laughs> come back to Titus. <clears throat> okay, Titus uh, chapter 1 and verse 12. 
Uh, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, even beast, uh, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and it goes on and on and on. <clears throat> Again, even though this isn't uh, as spiritual as the, the first two, that, that the word beast is still being used and is still identifying something that is vile, something that is corrupt, something that... Um, uh, is not representative of God's nature. <clears throat> Worse than that, but that's the kind way of putting it. Okay. And then uh, finally, one more, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, <clears throat> verse 32. Uh, we might start at 31. <clears throat> How about 30? <laughs> um, yeah, my usual statement at this point is Genesis 1 1. <clears throat> okay, why stand we in, je this is verse 30. Uh, why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, uh, what doth it profit me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that can be interpreted in many ways, and I know a lot of scholars uh, have said, well, it's similar to what happened in Rome where they had the Colosseum and everything. I, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure if there was any sort of Roman Colosseum in Ephesus, but I don't think Paul was in their fight. I'm just going with that. I just don't think he's in there. So he's got to be referring to maybe using that imagery, but he is talking about in his ministry and in his dealing that he's wrestling with beasts, okay? All right, so from that, we get a good cross section. We get, we get Peter, we get Jude, we get Titus, and we get Paul, all of them making references to, to beast. And I'll mention this here in a minute. But that's significant because just the word beast is used 21 times in the book of Revelation. 21 times, that's a lot, you know? And it, and it uh, well, what, there's 22 chapters? You know, almost one every chapter at least. And of course, I'm not even including the word beasts or any other reference that might, you know, you have dragon or, or bad guys or anything like that. Um, yeah, Satan or the devil or... <clears throat> All right. So, therefore, when I use the term beast throughout, it is not necessarily a reference to one specific entity called the beast, but to all beasts that exhibit the same behaviors. What behaviors? Beast or beastly behaviors. Um, there are several different kinds of beasts within the book of Revelation, but most of them represent the same spirit. For example, the beast is described as having many heads, but all are one in being and share one body. So let's, let's go back to Revelation and let's look in chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Okay, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. All right, so a lot of little information in there, but um, let's see. Let me see where I left off. Uh, there are several different kinds of beasts. Uh, the beast is describing, described as having many heads, but all are one in being and share the same body. And you notice this beast has many heads. And you see this in the book of Daniel also. Um, 
it appears like a different headship, but they're, you know, different, there's a difference. But really, they're all drawn from the same spirit that's in that body. <clears throat> uh, there are specific names given throughout this book, such as Jezebel, Babylon, Egypt, false prophet, and I've got several references there, but most of you know those. Um, uh, in fact, we're, we're close here, so let's look at one of them. Revelation 11, verse 8. <clears throat> and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And so here you're, <clears throat> you're, given, you're given names that the people of God from their foundation... Um, have equated with evil and beasts because they control them, they enslave them, they on and on and on. And um, uh, it's, it's saying that, um, that, that the spiritual name is Sodom or Egypt, which seems, okay, you go, well, wait a minute, there's a big difference between Sodom and Egypt. Different heads appearing different same body and he says spiritually it's the same thing and those things are significant we don't always catch those things we don't always see into the spirit of the thing we're too busy trying to figure out the symbols and you know like it's some great mystery based on understanding symbols instead of seeing the spirit of what's going on and that's what i think god's trying to say to the seven churches he's trying to focus them on, on a greater reality. And I'll say that later on too. But the book of Revelation, I want you to just think about this. The book of Revelation does not really deal with theology or Bible subjects or Christian ethics or any of the things that all the other books deal with. Well, what the heck's it in there for then? because it's dealing with the spirit of two main entities, the beasts, and I'll say it like this, the lambs. He's the lamb and we're the followers of the, the beasts and the lambs. And when it gets right down to it, all of the doctrine and all the theology and all of the symbolism and all the trying to figure out, apparently, by the time you get down to the book of Revelation, it really doesn't, it's not what counts. What counts is a discernment of what is the lamb and what is the opposite of the lamb, you know. And I've used this as an example before some years ago, but, you know, we think that if, well, if somebody gets up there and they teach the book of Revelation, they teach all these prophecies and they give us their meaning and they tell us what it's about so that we know what's coming, then we'll avoid it. <clears throat> wrong. Look at, look at Peter. On the very day that he denied him, Jesus said to him, Peter, you know, Peter said, I'll never deny you. I'll, ne I'll never deny you. I will die with you. Jesus said, no. He says, this day you're going to deny me three times. Well, why am I bringing that up? Because in a sense, that's a prophecy. He's giving him four you say four knowledge, four information, prophetic information of what's coming. And he still, because something was wrong, his spirit was willing, but his flesh is weak. There's something wrong spiritually in his nature that made him susceptible to fall in this situation. Do you agree? And if that's the case, then... Bible prophetic information is not what we need. We need to know the Lord. We need to know what's not the Lord. And if our hunger is after the Lord, if our desire is for the Lord, we'll know the Lord. But if our desire is for, well, based on my fears and my insecurities and my stuff, you know, my syndrome that works in me, I need to know what's coming so that I can avoid it. You won't. You need to know Jesus, and you need to get your heart off of prophecy. Prophecy, you know, there's not a throne with prophecy sitting on it in heaven. 
you know, that's, it's Jesus. And you know what? It's not just Jesus because the book of Revelation calls him the Lamb of God. Almost never uses the name Jesus because the Lamb is not identifying a Messiah. It's identifying a nature. And that's what we're supposed to conform to, is nature, not as, you know. I mean, even, even, the, even Philippians 2, 5, that says, let this mind be in you. Well, if you look at the next verses, it's talking about the mind of this kind of nature, of self-giving, uh, laying down his life, becoming as a man, not, not thinking of a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God, um, coming in a form of man and as in the form of man becoming a servant and then becoming obedient and then becoming obedient unto death down, 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 down. Selfless giving that in verse 11 or 10, God, after all of that, exalts it. Wherefore? Wherefore? Because of this selfless giving. Not because of what he accomplished in salvation, not in those scriptures. Because of this selfless giving. God hath highly exalted him. See, it's that, it's that nature that makes a difference. It's why we receive Jesus, you know, not just to save us from hell, but to be conformed to his image. That's, you know, we miss that sometimes. Amen? Sometimes people miss that. Because <laughs> in their pursuit for doctrine, they miss the Lord. Can you think of anybody, uh, maybe several people who have done that? A whole group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees. Where did they come from? Not just out of the Babylonian captivity. They were raised up. I'm getting off here and I don't need to do this. But they were raised up out of a situation where um, the priests were the ones who did the offerings and and the, and the priests primarily, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, the priests primarily were about giving God what he wanted in terms of the crucified lamb. Amen? Think about it. The Pharisees were not priests. You don't hear hardly anything about the priests in Jesus' day in the Gospels. You don't, you don't hear about them. Well, we got questions or stuff. Their, their job was to give God what he wanted most in the world, the crucified lamb. The Pharisees come along. They go, well, I see a vacuum here. People need to be taught. People need to be taught by us. People need what we have. <laughs> you know? And think about their arguments. They're all fighting over what the Bible says instead of offering God what he wants. There's the lamb again. There's the book of Revelation. There's the thing that's missing again. And so this whole new uh, uh, area, this whole new organization, if you will, not, I don't know what it would be called. I can't think of a better word, but pardon? Yeah, this whole new ministry that, all, that really, in a very real way, supersedes priests that are ordained of God and called of God to give him what he wants. And they're the ones that are in the face of Jesus, arguing, contesting. Book of Revelation, folks. They're the beasts. They're the one who crucified Christ. Okay, And we know... We know Jesus laid down his life. We know this was the plan of God. But we're talking about their motive. The book of Acts says, you know, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God before the foundation of the world, he determined that Christ would lay down his life, okay? But then Peter turns and says, but you, by wicked hands, God's motive was good, but you, by wicked hands, have crucified the Lord of the Prince of Life. Okay. So motive determines nature a lot of times, you know, or vice versa at times. If, if your nature is such, it will have a certain motive. Anyway, I'm not getting very far here. <clears throat> All right. Though there are, uh, we, we talked about 
Jezebel, Babylon, Egypt, false prophet, and many, many more, though their names are different, this is done because they represent the beast in its various forms. Oh, what was it? Oh, yeah. I was just reading, and I don't have time to write down everything when the Lord's sharing with me for these classes, but I was reading, and I thought about Jezebel, and then I started going, I, I, I just glanced back over in uh, Revelation 2 where it talks about it, and, and God is contending with the church saying, get that Jezebel out of here because by her fornication, she is corrupting everything, and, you know, we'll, we'll explain the spiritual meaning of that shortly, within six months for sure. <laughs> but uh, then I realized that's the exa same exact thing that God said of Babylon, the great harlot, the great whore, is the King James word for it. Exact same words. And I went, you know what? See, we have to see, we have to get off of the name. We'll explain Jezebel to me. We'll explain Babylon to me. Well, you know, well, what if they're one and the same with just different heads and the heads appear different? But they're really the same thing, you know? <clears throat> All right. So, I read a sentence. <laughs> Yay. All right, so I'm going to reread that sentence. Though their names are different, this is done because they represent the beast in its various forms. All right, natural disasters, armies, plagues, world governments, that's all in the book of Revelation, right? All of those things, all are pictures of the result that takes place when beasts are in control. And you, you find in the book of Revelation that that's why it's being, it, why it's being released, why it's happening. <clears throat> God's emphasis on the terrible nature of these beasts can be seen in the fact that the word beast is used 21 times in this book. <clears throat> All right, but, but though there are so many beasts and forms taken by them, the book of Revelation is primarily centered on two main kinds of animals, beasts and lambs. And that's where all the give and take is, and that's where the storyline keeps going. And that's where our attention is supposed to be. That's where God said in the very beginning, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and then shows the lamb on the throne and then shows the seals being released and boom, you're supposed to, you know, are, are you listening, church? That's what he's saying. I prepared you, now do you see it? And we go, well, I wonder what, wonder what them stars in his hand means, you know? Well, what about the guy standing there with them in his hand? Let's discern him. All right, so since these two are at odds with one another, we are also presented with two different kinds of power. Now, the book of Revelation, I've told you this before, but the word power and authority they're used more in the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible. Why? Because you're seeing the only two real powers in the, in the earth. And you're seeing how they operate. The premise, the basis, the foundation of what, what comes from them is the book of Revelation. Don't get, don't get lost in the imagery. Find the spirit that is producing the different things within that. <clears throat> um, the uh, beasts are a picture of destructive and oppressive power. They go about to overpower and thereby overcome their opponents. The nature of beasts can be partially summed up with several different descriptions. Those who have this nature insist on being the one who gives the orders and mete out the punishment. Well, that was, if nothing else, that was the Pharisees, wasn't it? But it's more than the Pharisees. You go right on through. You go to Nebuchadnezzar, <gasps> king of Babylon. Oh, my God, it's almost as if all this is tied together. <laughs> and you see this. And, of course, what, what, happened, uh, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar 
while he was in Babylon. Mallory, can you tell us what happened? <laughs> Well, and, and in that insanity, he, he, he grew his hair that looked like feathers, and he grew whatever, and he looked like a beast, and he acted like a beast, and he carried himself like a beast because he was a beast. That was only a manifestation when he was, didn't have a crown on his head and wear gorgeous robes and say, I'm a glorious, honorable, great king. God showed him for what he was. Wow. Wow. God could see through all that. <clears throat> um, so the nature of the beasts are summed up uh, partially in uh, some of these things. <clears throat> the beasts are bullies, for they love to go after the weakest of creatures. They prey on the poor and needy and set out to conquer lambs. Okay, you say, well, where's that? Well, let's just, one scripture comes to my mind here, Romans chapter 8. Um, verse 30. Verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed, or the word there is also translated slaughtered, all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Okay. Next verse, where most people justify away verse 36 with verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. From that, and they don't read what went before or after, from that, they conclude that that means, oh, no, we're the conquerors. He didn't, first of all, he didn't call you a conqueror. He said you're more than a conqueror, which to God, what is more than a conqueror, you know, is a lamb, yeah. You are more than con conquistadors. Well, I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, so let's read. Let's, you, you, you got to eat the meat Let's read the, the sandwich on either side, the bread on either side, verse 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It's at this point when I read that that I always say, that's the very thing that separates most people from the Lord. Well, nakedness or peril or, fa fa or, 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 or uh, sword or these kind of things. Lord, why are you bringing this upon me? Why is this happening? I thought we were supposed to be blessed. I thought everything was supposed to go our way. They know nothing about being a lamb, so they're confused. Be, you know, don't be, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. What is this? I thought everything was going to go wonderful. I thought our lives were going to be, you know, <laughs> prosperity. I thought everything was going to, you know, you, you can't get more prosperous than the riches of Christ. You just can't. You can't. There's, it's not possible. But some people, and guess what? The book of Revelation is full of it. Some people want power and position and strength and glory. Some people, I wonder who they are. Could it be maybe beasts? We're not there yet, but just little hints along the way here. And then the other, the other piece of bread on the other side. Um, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation or creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right. <clears throat> now, if you even suggested in most churches that you might be a, basically your walk with the Lord is to be a lamb slaughtered all the day long, and that you do that to manifest Christ in death, not to avoid it, or principalities or powers or height nor depth, all of that, any other creature, 
they get upset because here's why. They say, well, we've got the victory. The victory's already come, so we're, we live in victory. Well, maybe we don't understand that the victory, first of all, is Christ in you. The victory is Christ. And as his body, as his bride, as his church, as one with him, we are supposed to be one after his kind. And we do that because we believe life comes out of death. And we are self-giving. We are selfless. We are, will not put ourselves first. We put others first, gladly. Okay. Well, that doesn't sound good to a beast. That's the wisdom of this age. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 for sure. <laughs> it's the wisdom of this age. It's the wisdom of the book of Revelation had by the beasts. It's no longer teaching like in Corinthians. Now it's imagery and action. It's manifestation. So, even though the wording and teaching on a chalkboard of God's doctrine and view is not in the book of Revelation, the manifestation of it sure is. Because the Lord never leaves his son. He never, he never leaves his son. He, he always has him in the center. In the center. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, I read this little phrase, they pray on the poor and needy. Um, most of you remember the beginning classes on the book of Revelation as we discussed how the seven churches were persecuted and uh, under duress and uh, oppression from larger forces were being brought to bear upon them and they were, they were discouraged. Um, some of you may know that uh, it, it says of the children of Israel that when they came out of Egypt and they were heading toward the promised land that I think it was the Amalekites they would they wouldn't attack head on they would get in the back and they would wait for the weak ones to fall a little bit behind and they're the ones that they would attack. Folks, when Jesus came, Jesus drew in the weak and the poor and the lame and the blind and the halt and the hurting and the, you know, those were the ones that not only were drawn to Jesus, but didn't feel ashamed because of whatever problem they had in his presence, as if, what are you, what are you sick people doing here? You're all supposed to be healed. <laughs> you, you kind of get my point. My point isn't so much those exact words as much as it is that Jesus is there and calls, and we, we saw this in 1 Corinthians, um, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many noble, but God hath chosen the foolish things and the weak things of the world and this and that. He does that so that Christ, so that in our weakness, Christ can become our strength. He does that because it's the greatest opportunity to manifest Christ in our weakness. We think the greatest opportunity to manifest Christ is when we're put on a big stage and... Yeah, yeah. I'm coming in hot. <laughs> you know? but, but that's not it. It's in our weakness. It's in our lack that he becomes everything. We say Christ is all in all. Well, you know, in, in many cases he's not. Um, you know, in my present physical condition, uh, sometimes it gets discouraging. Uh, 
I mean, when you can't do the slightest things, I mean, my trash can accidentally tipped over and all the trash went out on the floor and I couldn't pick it all up. I, first of all, I felt like an idiot <laughs> that I knocked my trash can over. And my wife did come up later when she came in and did all that for me. Didn't say a word, she just did it. But, you know, I'm calling myself an idiot. How can you do that? And then I'm upset because I can't reach, I can't even reach that far over and down to pick it all up. Well, I don't stay in that, sit, I don't stay in that place very long. I don't. I don't. I, first of all, I can't afford to. That's a luxury I can't afford. <laughs> I must be with Jesus, and I must be with Jesus at all times. And I must live what I preach, because living it is more important to me than preaching it. And I must check myself, because I don't have anybody else to check me, if you know what I mean. You know, when David got discouraged, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God, it says. You know what I mean? And uh, the wording there, he encouraged himself. Because everybody else was upset with him. That was at Ziglag when everybody was all upset with him. <laughs> so, you know, if he's going to, you know, when you're, yeah, you, you're pretty much, everybody's down on you and cursing you and saying bad stuff about you. If you're going to get any encouragement, you're going to have to do it yourself. You know, well, um, there is a place for that. If we're always waiting for somebody else, you know, well, I, you know, I want the pastor to intervene or to say this or to do that. He knows, he can see that I got problems or whatever. But, and you know what, Ben was sharing on that just this past Sunday morning. And it was good. It was good stuff. Um, you have to develop a lifestyle of saying, you know what? I'm getting up and going for the Lord. And that means in my situation, I can't physically get up and go for the Lord, but I can say, you know what? This is an opportunity and I don't wanna miss it. This is an opportunity that in my weakness, if I embrace this by Christ crucified, life comes out of death, strength comes out of weakness, and more Jesus will reach people through a, and I'm going to just say it like this, through a stupid, weak vessel that is pretty much dead weight, except Christ can come out greater than all the years of ministry. All right. That sounds good. It's a great sermon. And I preached it for years. Anybody ever heard me say stuff like that before? Um, but now is the time to have it work in spirit, soul, and body. And body. I have to be with the Lord where he, and it shouldn't be a burden to me to be with the Lord in this since this is his highest. You know, I always think of that scripture where the, 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 you know, first two commandments, you know, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. But you know, that's different for different people. Did you know that? Because not everyone has the same amount of strength. You love him with the strength you have, you know. We're going, well, he's strong, and I don't have that much strength, and I can't do it. He's not asking you to love him with his stuff or her stuff. <laughs> he's asking you just love him where you're at, with what you got, with what, however much heart you got, however much your soul is in, however much strength you have in your body, love the Lord with that. Love Jesus. Love him. You know? Instead of uh, complaining about what you don't have, rejoice in what you do. And here's what I mean by that, not what most people mean. Rejoice in what you do, and what you do have is, in your weakness, Christ is, is being manifest. Christ is being your strength. Christ is reaching people 
that you don't even, you may not even be aware of. You, you understand? Because it's not a mental thing. This is where we get messed up. We think everything's supposed to be mental, you know, and uh, it's not. It's spiritual. Uh, so, so the, some of those people stand before Jesus, and he says, you know, well done. When I was in prison, you visited me, and when I was hungry, you fed me, and da-da-da-da, and their response, when, they're looking at each other going, when did we do that? <laughs> you remember that? They didn't go, oh, man, we know it. We marked that down. That, we were planning on bringing that up if you didn't. <laughs> you know, because because we know that was one of our high points. Not so. They didn't even realize it. It was just a manifestation of Christ in that you did this to the least. You've done it unto me. Just a manifestation by life. It's like breathing or heart beating or whatever else. It just is happening. Life is happening like that. But we're so up here in our heads, you know, trying to work our heads into this. You know, whereas the heart, it's just, it's just beating. It's just, what are you doing down there? I'm keeping you alive. What, what is your function? I'm all about life. That's your heart. What about your head? Oh, he talks all the time. <laughs> you can't shut the guy up. And what else does he do? He's always trying to figure everything out. You know? <laughs> and... You know, even if you get it figured out, the Lord's going to change it up on you because he doesn't want your head in conjunction with him. He wants your heart to know him and to be with him. And so, um, so, so I, I, I took the time to say all of that, and it's getting close to time to quit, but I took the time to say all that, to go over that, to tell you that um, I'm not just talking. I'm not a professional preacher here talking to you. These are things that I've learned in the trenches and I'm having to put to work in the trenches. If they're not real now, they'll never be real. You know what I mean? It, then, it, then it all was talk. And I don't want it to be talk. I love the Lord. I want the Lord. I want, I, if I believe this and I do with all my heart, then I want it working in me. And I want it overriding my thoughts. And I want it, well, folks, that's the book of Revelation. That's the, that's the, that's the uh, faithful witnesses that are flowing with the spirit of, of Christ crucified and selfless giving for others. They're, 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 it's a joy to them because they know that this is going to bring the defeat of the kingdom of the beast, and this is going to redound back to others and the blessing and, and care of others. They know it. So they're with the Lord. They will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. <laughs> they're like, yeah, let's do this, you know? And, um, and they don't look at themselves as special because it's not them. It's not I but Christ. Not I. I'm crucified, not I. Well, you just think you're something. Yeah, I think I'm dead. In fact, I know I'm dead. And I'm not something. And I don't know more than most people. I just know what little I know of Jesus. And I plan on sticking with it. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced of it. So I talk with authority when I talk about it. I don't just go, well, I hope this is right. You know, but you, well, you know what I'm saying. I mean, come on. You know, I mean... It's, it's, you know, the, to speak with authority doesn't mean you're a know-it-all or you think you know it all or you think that everybody else is dumb. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means, you know, if I really believe this, I need to, I need to stand up in the face of anything and say, you know, this is, this is what I've seen. And I'm going, see, I can't walk by your knowledge, so I'm going to walk by the, what the Lord has given me. People will find fault with you no matter what you do, though. You know that. So you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And, and just like what we read in Romans, we're still there. I haven't even turned the page yet. Height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor power, nakedness, or peril. You don't, in the middle of nakedness and peril, say, where's God? You say, he's right here. If somebody says, where's God? You say, he's right here. He lives in me. <laughs> How much time we got? Uh, 
Seven minutes, wow. Well, we might ought to quit because of our, we do have children here that have to go to school tomorrow, right? All right, let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs> 